Like many little girls, thank you. Like many little girls, I grew up obsessed with The Wizard of Oz. But it wasn't Dorothy who I identified with. The character that I wanted to be was the Wicked Witch of the West. Sure, she was scary, but she was a boss. She had a flying broom and an army of monkeys, and she knew how to make an entrance in a big poof of red smoke. And if you messed with the Wicked Witch or, or took her, her, her ruby slippers or, or messed with her sister, <laughs> she was gonna fuck you up. <laughs> the witch was big and powerful, and all eyes were on her. As a scrappy little first grader, a child so small that I was on a doctor-prescribed daily regimen of high-fat, high-protein milkshakes, being that kind of big had great appeal to me. The Wicked Witch of the West wasn't just physically imposing. Yeah, she had the pointy hat and the green face, but most importantly, she was in full control of her life. Unlike myself, who often felt like I was in the midst of a tornado. My mother and I lived in a studio apartment in Greenwich Village, which by day was vibrant with my mother's actor friends, and by night filled with a string of gay guys that she pretended to be engaged to for their work events so that their employers would think they were straight. <laughs> All of this was wonderful, but in the quiet of the night, after my mother thought I'd fallen asleep, I heard her crying on the phone about how she wasn't sure she would make rent that month. My parents had recently divorced after a five-year marriage. They met while living the breezy lives of 20-somethings in the 1960s and naively mistook their love for Greenwich Village for a love of one another. According to my father, my mother became too focused on middle-class acquisitions like wall-to-wall -wall uh, carpeting. He said, when I met your mother, she was a spunky little beatnik who could roll a joint with one hand. Now all she wants is a Hoover vacuum. My mother said they divorced because m all my father wanted to do was get high and stare at a fishbowl. <laughs> we didn't have our carpet, but my mother had just landed a secretarial position at the New York Times, and I thought we were doing okay until the night that I heard her sobbing about our financial problems. I needed to do something. One of the things that I always loved about the Wicked Witch was she made shit happen. Life wasn't happening to her, she was happening to it. I wished I had those kind of superpowers, but I knew I didn't. And yet still, I needed to take action. I had to do something. So, I decided to have a sidewalk sale of anything in our apartment that I didn't think we, uh, that I didn't think we needed. I sold our teacups, you know, we really never used them. I sold my mother's cinnamon color suede boots that she said pinched her toes. And I sold her copy of The Fear of Flying because she didn't really seem afraid of airplanes. <laughs> we lived across the street from the Quad Cinema, a new concept in movie viewing in the 1970s where four different movies played under the same roof. So this gave our apartment building on West 13th Street great foot traffic the perfect place for a first grader's sidewalk sale. A lanky woman in a safari print wrap dress approached. She cheerfully bought our sugar bowl, but pressed her lips together with pity when she saw that laid out with all of my other wares on, uh, on my blanket, I was trying to sell my mom's diaphragm. <laughs> when my mother returned from work that evening, I proudly handed her the $50. She reached and withdrew her hand three times before finally taking the money and putting it in her purse, telling me, honey, don't sell any more of our stuff. To make matters worse, my father was off in London pursuing his music career, promising that when he returned, it would be with a million dollar record contract. My father wanted to do right by us, but the problem was he just didn't have much capacity for the mundane realities of life. His generous instincts didn't do us much good because he was always broke and high and gone. Earlier that year, he called me at four in the morning from London to tell me that he was sitting in a bathtub having a bad LSD trip 
And then he cried as he told me about his sister's polio diagnosis 40 years earlier. <laughs> I wanted to be a good daughter and comfort him, but on the other hand, I was like, Daddy, I know you're really struggling, but I, I'm six years old and I have show and tell tomorrow. <laughs> and, and what is LSD? <laughs> My father ended that middle of the night acid trip phone call by telling me, as he often did, that I was the only person who truly understood him. The tenderness was thrilling, but also unsettling. The special connection felt sacred, but at the same time, it was counterfeit, because the truth was, at six years old, I, I really didn't understand his emotional complexity. But even then, I realized that if the only person who my father thought understood him really didn't, then he was completely alone in the world. And worse, it was my inability to understand him that, that had left him there. While my father was tripping in London, my mother was looking for a sleepaway camp for me for the summer. New York City in July is like Dante's Inferno, if Dante were a pimp doused with whiskey and urine. <laughs> my mom took a couple extra hours at her job and found Camp St. Regis, located right on the curve of a small bay in East Hampton with craggly white cabins and a beach that was all our own. My cabin was filled with other six-year-old little girls who smelled like copper tone and chapstick. The older girls wore halter tops and wedge sandals, and they wore Love's Baby Soft. This place was cool. <laughs> Camp was surprisingly affordable considering the fancy location and the fact that it offered horseback riding lessons and sailing and every other sport you could imagine. But the best part of camp was that at the end of the summer, they would produce a big musical. And that year, it was The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> where I was sure I would be cast as the witch. Among the campers and the counselors, I was known for running around and straddling a broom, cackling and screeching lines from the movie, especially that I'd get them and their little dog, too. And your little dog, too. I don't want you to miss out. <laughs> While other campers were experimenting with counselors' makeup, trying to be pretty, I would use an entire palette of green eyeshadow to cover my face. I wasn't interested in beauty. It was power I sought. <laughs> and it worked. I would get daily requests to cackle for the other kids, and some of them looked terrified. Most of them were amused, but all were paying attention. <laughs> Acting like the witch quickly became my thing. It was my place in the camp ecosystem, and I had no doubt that I was going to be cast as a wicked witch in The Wizard of Oz. However, when the director, a 16-year-old basketball counselor, posted the cast list on, uh, it was like a house had been dropped on me. According to this freckle-faced point guard, <laughs> I was better suited to play the mayor of Munchkinland. <laughs> it's an important role, he told me when I protested. The mayor was elected by the Munchkins because he was well-respected. He is a pivotal character. Now, at six years old, I didn't know what pivotal meant, but I knew bullshit. No one gives a rat's ass about the mayor of Munchkinland because he doesn't do anything that matters. Does he live? Does he die? Do you remember? I don't <laughs> because no one cares about the mayor. No one gives a flying monkey what happens to the mayor of Munchkinland. He is irrelevant. I mean, you could write in a whole new scene where the entire Lollipop Guild busts out Uzis and, starts and assassinates the mayor <laughs> and splatters his munchkin guts everywhere. And the only way this is going to affect the story at all is that now Dorothy will have to step over a dead body on the <laughs> yellow brick road because nobody cares about the mayor. The witch, on the other hand, is integral. Without the witch, there's no conflict. There's no story. Nothing matters without the Wicked Witch of the West. 
The director explained that I was too small to play the witch. <laughs> I was a good foot and a half shorter than Dorothy, and he said it would be hard for the audience to believe that she felt threatened by me. <laughs> I mean, is this guy for real? Does he understand what a witch is? She has superpowers. She flies around on a broom and casts spells. Why was this guy directing when he had absolutely no vision and zero understanding of the material? I was so upset that I wrote my father a letter in London and I told him that camp was a cruel and unjust place <laughs> and that in protest, I was going on a hunger strike. <laughs> I mailed the letter on my way to the mess hall where upon realizing that dinner was macaroni and cheese, I forgot all about that hunger strike. <laughs> the following day, the director had an epiphany. He told me I had a lot of passion for the role, so he was going to create a new part. The Wicked Witch's little cousin who was vi visiting Oz for the weekend. <laughs> I I'm thinking of calling her the Little Witch of the South. Can you do a Southern accent? Oh, can, can I do a Southern accent? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, fine. You can be the Wicked Witch's little sidekick, and I'll be in every scene with the witch. He rolled his eyes and he rolled his eyes and kind of shooed me off, but <laughs> whatever. My star was rising and all was right with the world again. Until one night, when I heard a voice burst into the counselor's room of the cabin. Where's Jennifer? Is she okay? Is she in the hospital? It was my father, straight off a plane from England. I held my hands over my mouth in horror, remembering that letter. My counselor, Mary, asked, why wouldn't she be okay? My father told her about the hunger strike, and Mary laughed and said that I had not mixed a single snack, <laughs> much less a meal. I heard him drop what I soon learned were grocery bags filled with life cereal and Jif peanut butter. So here's what I don't understand. My father, who could figure out how to make an international phone call while on LSD, <laughs> never considered calling the camp but before taking a six-hour flight and then going to a grocery store. So I walked into the counselor's room. My father saw me and said, hey, look who's awake. It's Gandhi. <laughs> that was quite a scene you made over not being cast as the witch. Oh, I actually am a witch. Are you mad? He pondered for a moment and then shrugged. No, baby, I guess it was time for me to come home. I went on to play the Little Witch of the South at the end of the summer, and the Wicked Witch of the West and I wreaked havoc on Oz. We flew around casting evil spells. We conjured up a poppy field that put Dorothy out cold. And then we locked her up in our castle, set a giant hourglass, and told her that when that red sand ran out, she was dead. <laughs> oh, we were fierce. In the end, the Wicked Witch of the West and I were killed by a bucket of water. But we went down in a mad, cackling splash of glory. We went down fighting. And there was something powerful about that. As much as I loved my time on stage in The Wizard of Oz, the real magic for me that summer, it wasn't the show itself. It was learning that I had the power to create a new role for myself and change the script. I didn't need a broom. I didn't need ruby slippers. I just needed to realize that although I was small, my voice didn't have to be. I just needed to speak up loudly and demand to be heard. Thank you.